Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. I know you're as shocked as I am. Good to see you this morning. Would you stand with us? You know what today is? Amen. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We ask, Lord, for your will to be accomplished in our midst as we join together to worship you. We give you all praise, glory, and honor. And we thank you for your blessing that you have brought into this world through the gift of your Son. And we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.
darkness you gave hope You restore every heart that is broken Great are you, Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our Darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Hearts will cry, knees, bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, knees, bones will sing. Great are you. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Of 
Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just come into your presence. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. We thank you for the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the gift that you have given to each and every one of us. We come with praise and glory and honor to your holy name. We thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, for who you are. We give you praise. We give you glory. God, we lift up every need, every request across this congregation, both those that are in the building and those that are watching with us. We pray, Lord, that you would move and minister and touch each one. We pray for Dustin that you would minister to him and touch him, bring healing in his body. Lord, we're believing you to touch him in might and in power. For Dave and Bev, we pray, God, that you would move and minister to them. Touch them, bring healing in them. We thank you for what you're going to do. For Susan Windsor, continue to minister, continue to touch, continue to bring healing. And Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. And Father, I cry out. I cry out for our nation. I cry out for our world. I pray, God, that you would move in might and in power. That you would arise as never before. That you would be victorious, O oh Lord. Above all, I pray in this hour. Have your way in each and every one of us. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor for who you are. We bless your holy name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? I don't know if you understand what I'm about to say, but y'all just look good today. And I don't know if that's the turkey talking or... God is good. Thank you, Jesus. Um... You know, I, I, let me let me just throw this out. Uh, sometimes that you don't know if kids are listening. Um, sometimes, and I know parents have said, "Well, you know, my child they they color all their church, but you know they listen to a lot of stuff that you don't realize they're listening to." Um, Thursday, we were at John's for our family Thanksgiving, and of course. Uh, he fried a turkey and did a whole bunch. Of, we did a whole bunch of stuff, and um, uh, the boys were they were getting kind of restless. You know, uh, Collins kept going up to Kristen, going, "I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry," and finally he went up to her and said, "I gotta eat. I gotta take my back pill." <laughs> And uh, so uh, I hope you ate this morning so you can take your back pill. Um, it, it's, just, it's just an awesome time of year when we come right out of Thanksgiving and we come into Advent because today begins Advent. And for those of you who haven't noticed, we have our Chrismon tree. And uh, a Chrismon tree is unique in that Every ornament on the tree is handmade. There are no bought ornaments. Every ornament uh, was made by people in this fellowship several years ago. And you never put presents under a chrismon tree because the present is who the tree represents. And it represents Jesus. Every ornament on there speaks about Jesus. So you can take a look at that over the next few weeks and uh, it is also the first Sunday of Advent. And it's a time of reflection and preparation. Reflection on remembering that Jesus came. And realizing that proof of His coming also means that He is coming again. And so we not only look back to His first coming, but we look forward to He's coming back. Um, each, each Sunday in Advent represents something. And at the end of my message this morning, we will um, light the Advent wreath. Traditionally, it's lit by somebody named John. Do we have anybody named John in here today? Okay, well maybe uh, I didn't know if Emerald's middle name was John or something. So, but we'll we'll get somebody to light that at the end of the at the end of my message this morning. As I as I think about what it means, this this first Sunday represents hope. Uh, it's the prophecy week. It's the prophecy candle that we're going to be lighting. Uh, in just a few moments. But you have to realize the hope. Um, at the end of the Old Testament, uh, and it's, it's in the book of Malachi, uh, that was God's 
final word for a while. And he gave it to Malachi, and Malachi shared it with Israel, and, and we have it today. But then there's silence for 400 years. Um, during that 400 years, there are some pretty historic and also horrific things that happen uh, during those 400 years. And you have to, have to wonder if Israel questioned whether or not God was coming. Um, in that period of time, we have, uh, if you've ever read any of the Apocrypha, which are books that are no longer in our Bible, but they're, they're still, if for no other reasons, historical um, uh, references. Uh, the book of Maccabees especially uh, speaks of the Maccabean revolt and, and the, the miracle that brings about what starts, I believe it starts Monday. Uh, Monday begins Hanukkah. And it was a, a miracle that happened in the temple that the oil that's supposed to be replaced in the, in the um, candle uh, burned for eight days instead of one day. And so uh, that's why they celebrate Hanukkah. Uh, but it's it, during the history, it's during the Maccabean Revolt. Um, Antioch Epiphanes is also during this time and brings about a tremendous... Uh, some people believe that he was the Antichrist because of offering pigs on the altar and different things of that nature. Um, and while I believe he was a type and he is a forerunner of the Antichrist, one that is worse than he was is coming. I think you have to realize Hitler was a type of the Antichrist uh, because of what he did and the six million Jews that were put to death. Uh, but he is not the ultimate. He is a type and he is a forerunner of the one who is yet to come. During this 400 years of silence and 400 years of, of God, where are you? And, and, and then on the horizon, a man who dressed himself in animal skin and ate locusts and wild honey. I know I've heard of people eating chocolate-covered ants and... Uh, grasshoppers and things and um, while I'm very um, open-minded about trying new things I haven't come around to that just yet um, but John the Baptist is the voice that begins to cry that the Messiah is coming and in Mark chapter 1 the Bible tells us in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judah and all those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John becomes that voice crying out in the wilderness. And, and it, is, it is a unique relationship that John the Baptist and Jesus have. Because if you go all the way back to even before they're born, John recognizes Jesus. Uh, Mary and Elizabeth, 
her cousin are both pregnant about the same time. Um, Elizabeth is further along and John the Baptist is born before Jesus. Uh, but when Mary goes to see Elizabeth and she walks into the room where Elizabeth is, Elizabeth tells her that her baby, which is in her stomach, recognizes that she is pregnant with the Son of God because He leaps in her womb. Now, I've never been pregnant. I've looked like it sometimes, but I never have. And even though medical science may say some strange things and people today can, uh, can decide who they want to be or what they want to be, um, to my knowledge, women are the only people that get pregnant and have babies. Okay? Uh, and it takes a man and a woman. Now, this is not a biological lesson, so don't anybody start going, oh, I'm not going to. But <laughs> it takes a man and a woman, okay? And the beautiful thing about what happens to Mary is that, that no man is involved. What is done in her is done by the Holy Spirit. It is God who does this. And it was significant, and if you've been in our studies on Wednesday night in Hebrews, and we're looking at this now, the, the necessity for the humanity of Christ. It was not to make Him weaker, but it was to make Him the perfect high priest. He had to come in the form of His own creation, in the form of humanity, in order to become the high priest, in order to know how to minister to you and I in our times of need. He had to do that, but he had to do it not with Adam's nature, which was a sinful nature because of the fall, but he had to do it with God's nature because it was a perfect nature. And he had to be a perfect, sinless sacrifice. And it's interesting to me that, that the baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb. Now, Denise and I have always believed, I won't say always, but since we've been together and when we started having uh, children, we always believe that children can hear, even in the womb. And so we, we would take the time to read Scripture together out loud so that the baby could hear. We began to pray for that baby before it was ever even born. Because, and for no other reason, this story gives to us the realization that that is not a mass, it's not a blob, it's not a thing, it is a person because it recognized the kingship of Jesus Christ even in the womb. And you go to Paul's writing to Timothy, and when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, you have known the Scripture from, a child, from your childhood. You go back to the original text, and what the original word that is translated child or infant there means child yet unborn, which Paul is telling Timothy, you begin to learn the Scriptures before you were ever even born. So we, we would read Scripture to, to our children. We would, we would talk to them. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's a scientific fact that a child born can recognize the mother's voice or can recognize a voice. So the Bible just bears out the facts of, of where we are and the reality of what's going on and and so John the Baptist is, is linked with Jesus. And he becomes this forerunner who is the voice crying in the wilderness, calling people to repentance, but letting them know that one is coming after him that is greater than him, that he's not even worthy to tie his shoes. John says, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you 
with the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew chapter 17, Jesus gives us a unique glimpse into who John the Baptist was. <coughs> then his disciples asked him, Matthew 17 verse 10, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? And Jesus replied, and I'm, li I'm reading this in New Living Translation. I think I put it on the, on the paper, New King James, so that's Otis's fault. It's not Andre's. He's got the right scripture up that I told him to put up. I just told him the wrong version to put it in. And so while I'm talking, he's changing it because he's making up for Otis's mistakes. He's very good at that. He's had a lot of practice. <laughs> Matthew 17, 10 through 13 in the New Living Translation. And, and they're asking Jesus, why do, why do teachers of the law say that Elijah has to come before the Messiah? And if you go back to Malachi, the last book that's in, in the Old Testament, it tells us that Elijah and Moses will come before the Messiah. Well, Moses didn't come. But you also got to understand that I don't believe this is the only appearing that we're going to have. Because in the book of Revelation, it says that there are two witnesses that come forth that are crying out during the tribulation period. And most people believe, and which I ascribe to the belief, that those two people are Moses and Elijah. Some people say it's Enoch because Enoch never died and he has to die. But I don't... That was before the flood, before, and I just, I, he, he, Moses and Elijah are connected to Abraham, okay? And so that's why I believe it's Moses and Elijah. And so the question comes to Jesus, why do they say this? And in verse 11, Jesus said, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready for the Messiah. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. But he wasn't recognized, and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. And the disciples realized that he was talking about John the Baptist. Jesus said, I want you to know that John the Baptist was Elijah. Now, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell you, I don't fully understand all this. Okay? I know Elijah was caught up. And he didn't die. He was caught up in a whirlwind and he went to heaven. And I understand, and hey, that's wonderful and great. I, I don't fully understand everything, but I take Jesus at his word. Okay? I leave all the how fors to him. I'm kind of like David, my son, our son David. When he was talking to Kristen, and Denise and I were at the hospital, she was pregnant with John. And David was telling Kristen about the birth of their other sibling. At that time, we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. Not that we couldn't have known, we just didn't want to know. We wanted to be shocked. And boy, we've been shocked. But anyway, <laughs> David was talking to, to Kristen and he said, and, and Dad takes Mom to the hospital? And then the baby's born. And then they bring the baby home. Because he was the older brother. He'd been through this before. And Kristen looked at him and said, How does the baby get here? And David, without missing a beat, said, Jesus will make a way. <laughs> and that's exactly the way I believe in this. Jesus will make a way. I don't have to understand every little detail he will make. And, you know, come to find out in my life, that's the way a lot of my life has been. I haven't understood all the little details, but Jesus has made a way for me to get to this point in this place. And so the hope, that's what it's all about. The hope that John the Baptist brings 
when he says to them, the Messiah is coming. He's coming. Prepare. Prepare the way of the Lord. You know, in our own lives today, we are supposed to be that voice. We are supposed to be the voice crying out that Jesus is coming. I'm going to tell you, I don't know what we all may have to go through before He comes. I know the last year and a half was something I wasn't expecting. I don't know if you were expecting it. but I, and, and now in the last couple of days, now they're talking about another variant to this pandemic that has started in Africa. And I think I've heard this morning that it's already spread to Asia. And there's some in Australia. It hasn't made it to the U.S. yet. They're say, they don't know all the details. Well, they haven't known all the details about the whole thing. I don't know what we may have to go through. I don't know what we may have to endure. I don't know what's coming tomorrow. But I know this. Jesus is coming. And I also know this. He is more than able to keep us today. He is able to open doors. He's able to move mountains. If He doesn't move a mountain, He is able to help us tunnel through the mountain because I believe that our God is sufficient for this hour. The grace that He has given to us to live, the hope that He's given to us is not just for this life, it's not for just this moment, but I know that there is so much more beyond this moment and this life. I know that this moment and this life is but a breath. It's but a who? It's but a vapor. I saw a post one day this weekend, and I, I showed it to Denisa. It was it was a powerful post. It was this little girl that was looking in a in a it looked like a window, and on the other side there was an older lady. And the little girl was looking at, and the caption of the picture was, take advantage of every moment because it's a short journey. And I'm going to tell you what, when I look in the mirror, I'm going, what happened? We've got two pictures in our in our uh, china cabinet in the in the dining room and the boys we had all five boys there Wednesday and they were all looking at it and they there's a picture of Denise and I it was the year we got married and they were all going wow look at him he is young wow he's got hair and I'm going, okay, boys, I feel bad enough. You ain't got to... I mean, look. Look how dark his hair is. Yeah, well, the reason it's done like this is because of you. And because of your parents. <laughs> Mostly because of your parents. <laughs> but that, that's that quick. The Bible refers to this life as a vapor. That quick. And I know, I know when you're in your 20s and you're changing those diapers, you're praying, Lord, let this pooping machine grow up. I know I probably shouldn't have said that in my sermon, <laughs> but it's who I am. Lord, let this child grow up. So I don't, and now you go, wow, how quick. I don't forgot which one it was. Denise counted how many diapers we used. I don't, was it Kristen? Do you remember the number? 6,500 diapers in a year. In a year. Wow. See, I had it right when I said this machine. <laughs> but, but, you know, quickly changes. 
And then they're running around the house and they're getting into everything and you're going, oh, please. What? And then pretty soon you're sitting at the house and there's nobody running around the house. You know, I always wanted kids so I could get them to help me do stuff. And just about the time they get to where they can help me do stuff, they find somebody and they move away. <laughs> and I'm going, wait a minute. That's how quick life is. Take advantage of this moment. And if anything, the last two years has taught me the value of memories. And our motto now is make memories. Make memories. Because there's coming a day when those memories is what I hold on to. Denisa was trying to decide Thursday night if she was going to go out shopping with Kristen on Friday. And I'm going, I'm not going. You do whatever you want to do, I'll give, give you my wallet. I'm not going. She left the house at five something in the morning. I didn't even know there was a five but one time a day. But anyway, that's a whole different story. But this is why I told her Thursday night. Make memories. Don't know how many more of those you're going to have. Make memories. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, make memories. Take the time. What greater memory to have than the memory of your children accepting Jesus Christ. We look back and, and look, at, look at our kids. When David got saved, when Kristen got Kristen evangelized John. John was the hardest one. I know it shocks everybody. But Kristen was about six. John was about three. And Kristen, Kristen had accepted Jesus and she, she had John in her room and we we were standing out in the hall listening. And she said, now all you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your life. And you'll get this just warm feeling all over. And so they, he, he, she had him bow his head and pray. And then when they got through, she looked at him and she said, do you feel better? Nope. <laughs> Kristen didn't miss a beat. She said, we need to pray again. And I'm going, you know, even Jesus had to pray twice because there were some that he prayed for sight and when he asked them, could they see? And they said, well, we see things like big trees, so he prayed again. There's some people just a little bit more harder than others. It's okay. The hope that I have, the hope that I live with today is the hope in Jesus. The hope that I have today is more than I've ever, ever known because I have more to go to heaven for. Oh, I've always wanted to go to heaven to see Jesus. Now when I say I want to go, I'm not just chomping at the bit to go today. It's like the guy that was out and he said, everybody want to go to heaven, come outside with me. And this one guy just sat in, the, in his seat and he said, you're not... You don't want to go to heaven? He said, yeah, I do, but I thought you was getting up a load to go tonight. <laughs> we all want to go, but I'd like to stay here as long as I can. Okay? Because I know this. I know that's going to be wonderful. I know it's going to be great, but there's a lot I don't know. And I'm comfortable. When I say comfortable, I've got family, I've got friends. And this, my hope is in this, yes, but I have a hope that there's so much more far beyond this. And the hope that I have is one day I'll stand face to face with Jesus. I want to hear those words, well done. That's what I want to hear. I don't, I don't live for people to pat me on the back or people to say, oh, that, 
I want to hear Jesus say, well done. Because if I please the whole world, but I displease Jesus, what does it matter? The Bible puts it in a different way. If I gain the whole world and lose Jesus, what do I have? The hope is, has to be in Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is coming. He came. And the first time He came, He came in the form of His own creation. And we're going to look at that even more in depth over the next few weeks. But the prophecy that He's coming... John the Baptist knew he was coming because he recognized him while he was still in the womb and he knew he was coming. The voice crying out. Romans 8, 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groans Oh boy. I gotta eat so I can take my back for you. <laughs> for we know. Um. Yes. For we know that the whole creation groans. Yes, it does. And labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adopt adoption, the redemption of our body. You see, salvation is not complete yet. Hello? I have in part. I don't have it all because this body's still under the curse of sin and it's dying. But one day, whew, I'm going to have a glorified body. And when I look in the mirror, I won't be going, oh me. I'll be going, wow, look at that. <laughs> For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We hope for what is yet to come. I can't hope for a wonderful, beautiful wife. I've already got that. I hope for what I don't have. I hope for what is yet to come. I hope for the fulfillment of God's Word for this infusion fellowship. I hope for what is yet to come. For the outpouring of the Spirit of God. For His preparing our hearts and minds and lives. For the return of Jesus. He's coming back. He's coming back. You can't be limping to the finish line. He's coming back for a strong and bold church. Without spot, without blemish. Oh, I'm not talking about what the world sees. Because people looking at you, they're always going to find fault. I'm talking about what he sees. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't look at me the way people look at me. Titus, Paul writing to Titus says, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present, age, looking 
for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Oh God, let us arise in that hope. Let us walk in that hope that You're calling in each and every one of us today. God, have Your way in our hearts and in our lives. Robert Davison, I know your name's not John, but would you be so good as to come over here, take that lighter, uh, striker, flame, light one of the purple candles? This is the hope candle. The prophecy candle. Um, Austin, don't, uh, yeah, Austin. Flip those lights off. I know it's not totally dark in here, but I want you to think about that flame in the darkness. Jesus is the light. The light in the darkness. And what this world sees is the amount of Jesus that's in each and every one of us. We're to be that light. We're to let the light of Jesus shine forth through our lives. We're to be that voice now crying out, Jesus is coming. Not in a condemning manner, but in a manner that there's hope. Oh, I don't know what this pandemic is going to be. I don't know what the future may hold. But I want to let you know about the hope that I have that is in Jesus Christ. Hey, I know some people still say, oh, there's nothing to all this mess. I've had it. Spent eight days in the hospital. Still deal with after effects in my lungs. I'm not living in fear of it because my hope is in Jesus. Am I taking precautions? Oh, yeah. You know, the Bible says walk carefully nothing wrong with taking precautions but it's also a way that we can say listen I don't know what the future is going to bring I don't know what, what's going to happen in this world if I understand my Bible correctly the Bible says that things are going to get worse Pastor, don't encourage us this morning. But the realization is, look, that's the world. I'm not tied to this world. I'm tied to Jesus. And if they take everything I have, they can't take Jesus. If they take this life, they can't take Jesus. I have hope in what is yet to come. I have hope that if today is my day and Jesus calls my name, <laughs> absent from the body is present with the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Remember when they were taking Jesus to be crucified and the crowd Many of them jeering, but the, the women behind him were weeping. And Jesus turns to them and says, Don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. The weeping I do these days were for Otis. Because I miss people so bad but I know what they're enjoying 
doesn't even hold a candle to what we see and understand. Don't weep for me. Allow Jesus to arise in our hearts and in our lives with the hope of what is yet to come. If I live to be 120, thank you, Jesus. As long as my mind can remember to take my back pill, I'll be good. I want to hold on to His hand. Because I know everything around me will fall away. But He, He will remain. In the beginning was the Word. And can I tell you, at the end, the Word will still be. Father, we thank You for who You are and for what You're doing in our hearts and in our lives. I thank You for this opportunity to come into Your house. God, touch our hearts, touch our minds. Search us, O Lord, today. And I know that there are times in all of us that life seems to just tumble in and crash in on us and sometimes we don't even feel like we can breathe. Help us to take the next breath. Help us to take the next step. Your grace, Your grace, your grace. Give us and remind us of the hope that we have that is in You. It's not in ourselves. It's not in this world. It's not in stuff. It's not in things. It's not in circumstances. It's not in this government. It's not in anything around us. Our hope is in You. And we look to You. God, have your way in each and every one of us today. I give you praise. I give you praise for who you are. Help me to lift up my eyes above the storm, above the circumstances, above the trials of this day, above the pains, above the hurts, and focus on you. peace speaker, the hope giver, the source of our salvation, the finisher of our faith. God, I just thank you for who you are. We praise you. We magnify your holy name. We worship you. Have your way in our hearts and in our lives. Today, we thank you. We give you praise for who you are. And we celebrate the prophecies that foretold your coming the first time. But we look forward to those that are telling us you're coming back. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And believe. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Remember the events of this week, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, our live feed, uh, our Bible study. We're in the book of Hebrews. We're actually in chapter 3 of Hebrews this week. So come and join with us. You don't want to forget that. December the 12th is our children's Christmas program. It'll be during our Sunday morning service, so please remember that. Uh, Tyler, if you would come. Uh, dress rehearsal and a happy birthday Jesus party is next Sunday, December the 5th at 3 o'clock. And it's here.
I'm just trying to remember, is Arsdale having a parade next week? If it is, it may be a problem getting here at 3 o'clock. So we may need to look at that. Um, so anyway, I'll get with Phil and Lori. We'll figure that out, let you know more about that as we're coming. Tyler? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. There we go. I hope all of y'all had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you ate way too much and you felt <laughs> terrible like I did. Um, but it was a great nap. So all good naps go and glut me a little bit, I guess. Um, today we're going to be having youth at 3.30. I encourage all of you, if you know a youth that wants to come or somebody that's just looking for a place to belong, I greatly encourage you to bring them. Bring them here. We'll treat them like family, um, rough them up, stuff like that. Um, this Friday, we're going to be having a youth bonfire at my house. Um, definitely encourage you all to come. Parents that want to stay around and hang out, you're not too old, I promise. You can hang out with us. Um, we're just going to have fun. We're just there to have fun, hang out, spend some time together, build, build a sense of family together um, more than we already have. Um, so that's all we got going on right now. Um, next Sunday, I should be able to have a locked-in time and day. For the youth Christmas party, and I'll get that to you as soon as I can. Thank you. God's good. Would you stand with us? May the Lord's blessings be upon each of you. As we go through this Advent time, Christmas season, Don't get caught up in the junk. Remember what it's about. Somebody said, you know, because of the supply problems, this Christmas may not be so great because, listen, it's not about what you're giving in gifts. Make memories. That palm tree tie that you're giving somebody. Yeah. But make a memory. May the Lord bless you, keep you. May you let others know how much you love them and how much you love Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, I just want you to know to begin this Christmas season, I want you to feel love, so I'm going to let you take me to lunch today. Lord bless you. We'll see you this week.